Hello everyone, we've come to that time now where we're going to look at God's Word. We're continuing in Luke's Gospel and we're going to look at a very important passage that continues from last week. Last week we looked at Jesus preparing the Passover and so today we're going to carry on. The next passage is Luke chapter 22 verses 14 to 20. Luke 22 14 to 20. And in my translation, my Bible, it says, Institution of the Lord's Supper. Verse 14, let's hear God's word. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you, that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And that's God's word. The institution of the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper has many names in the church. It's called the Lord's Supper because that's what it was. It was the Lord who instituted it at a supper. It's called Holy Communion. It's called the Eucharist. These are names that you'll come across in Reformed churches. It's also called the Breaking of Bread. But we're going to look at the Lord's Supper. I'm going to treat this as more as a topic and look at the text, we're going to look at what it means, what the Lord's Supper means, what it means in its context. So we're going to look at some heads, headings, some points. The first point, the Passover and the Lord's Supper. The second point, the Lord's Supper, what it is. The third point, the effects it should have on us. And then we'll offer some uh, practical points. The Passover and the Lord's Supper. As I've said quite a few times in this sermon series, Luke really emphasises the end of the Old Covenant or Testament and the start of the New Testament. And we see it really vividly here. The Passover was pointing to Jesus. We talked about that a bit last week, didn't we? The Passover was a feast where Israel remembered their freedom from sin. They killed a spotless, pure lamb and put the blood on the doorposts of the house so they were saved from the judgment of God on Egypt. That's pointing forward to Christ. And it points forward to Christ because Jesus fulfilled it. And so Jesus fulfilled it and brought it to an end. But he gave us the Lord's Supper to point back to him. He gave us the Lord's Supper to point back to him. Do this in remembrance of me. I fulfilled the Passover. I'm the true Passover lamb. And so do this to remember me. Because the the lamb of the Passover was spotless. It was pure. It had to be without blemish. It was slaughtered and the blood was put, as we said, on the doorposts of the house. Jesus was perfectly holy, perfectly sinless, united to the will of God. And he was the lamb that was slain. He was called the lamb of God. And the blood of Christ cleanses us from our sins and delivers us from the wrath of God. It's also, as we'll see in a few minutes when we look at it, It's very important that this is a covenant meal. The Passover was a covenant meal. It was showing them, the people of Israel, 
that God was their God and they were his people. The Lord's Supper is that same covenant meal. He says the new covenant. We'll talk about that in a bit. The new covenant in my blood. God is, is giving this meal to say to the people, I am your God and you are my people. So the Passover was pointing forward, the Lord's Supper points back. There's loads of examples of that in the New Testament. The Sabbath was pointing forward to Jesus as our rest, as our saviour. The Lord's Day points back to Jesus, who fulfilled the Sabbath, brought it to an end and gave us a new day. We don't sacrifice lambs anymore. We don't worship on Saturdays anymore. We don't do festivals and new moons. Christ has fulfilled them, but he's given us a memorial meal and a beautiful day to remember him by. The shadows of the Old Testament are fulfilled in Christ and he gives us a new meal. It's a bit like the phoenix, if you're familiar with it. It's a mythical creature. The phoenix would die and out of its ashes a new phoenix arises. The substance, we've talked about form and substance as well. The form of the Passover and the Lord's Supper is different, but the substance is Christ. So we're going to look at the Lord's Supper. The two words, this is point two, the Lord's Supper. The two words that are used about the Lord's Supper in Christian circles are sacrament and ordinance. Now I'm okay with both those terms. I think when they're, proper, when they're properly explained, sacrament is from a Latin word that meant oath. It was an oath. When a, when a soldier joined an army, he took a what's called sacramentum. It was an oath to the king. And he wore the king's badge, as British soldiers do, the king's badge to say that they were serving the king and they belonged to him. Like British soldiers do, they swear allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth and they wear the crown on their chest, I suppose, because they are serving her. An ordinance basically means something that Jesus Christ has ordained. I think both are okay. And I think in, I'll explain later on what I mean. Why I think both are okay and why both are really, really special and meaningful. What do we do at the Lord's Supper? Well, we do what Jesus and his disciples did. Jesus gave them bread and wine and they eat and drink to remember Jesus. We, at the Lord's Supper, we remember Jesus, we share Jesus and we proclaim Jesus. We remember Jesus it says in verse 20 of our passage, do this in remembrance of me. We remember him. We share Jesus. Now this is a different passage where the Lord's Supper is talked again is 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 16 says, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in in the body of Christ. And the third point, we proclaim Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. I haven't wrote it down. I think that's verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So the Lord's Supper is a visible sermon. And Chad Van Dixon a lovely Presbyterian pastor says the Lord's Supper should be like a sermon, food for the soul. We have the word preached, now we have the word seen. We have the gospel preached when we say Jesus died for you. Well, in the Lord's Supper, we have two beautiful emblems that say this is what Jesus did for you. It's fairly obvious, I think, what it means to remember and proclaim Jesus. When we take the bread, we look at bread and we see Jesus' body. We take the cup, we use juice, we see Jesus' blood, and we think of what happened to him and what that means for us. 
how Jesus bore our sins, how he reconciles us to God, how we become friends of God, how he was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, how we're united to him, how we're in him before the foundation of the world, how he calls us after he's predestined us, after we repent and we trust in him, he justifies us, he adopts us, he sanctifies us. These are all what we've been looking at on the first Sunday of the month. All of what we've been talking about is there for us in the bread and the wine. So everything that I'm talking about, all those sermons you're listening to, in those beautiful two symbols, bread and wine, all of that's there. It is food for the soul. It's a rich feast for the soul. It's a small meal for the body, but it's a rich feast for the soul. So we remember all that Christ is and all that he's done and we proclaim him. We proclaim him. But what does it mean to share the body and blood of Christ? The Lord's Supper, unfortunately, has been twisted to mean something it's not. I'm not going to go into the labels there are two broad schools of thought. There are people who believe when Jesus said, this is my body, he was being literal. There are Christians who believe that this is my body is a metaphor. You know, we all use language like metaphor. If I say, you know, they used to call me a chicken when I was at school because I didn't like going on rides at the fairground. So they call me a chicken. Now, I'm not really a chicken. It just means I was scared and a bit soft. So they call me a chicken. It's a metaphor. And I'm in the second school of thought. The Lord's Supper, when Jesus said, this is my body, I believe he meant three things. It's a symbol. It's a sign. And it's the spirit. A symbol sign and the spirit a symbol fairly obvious what I mean here a symbol this bread that I'm holding in front of you is a symbol of my body this wine is a symbol of my blood Bishop Ryle said in his paper on the Lord's Supper it is obvious that this bread represents my body and it is a memory of him. When scripture speaks so simply and clearly, why complicate things? And I agree. It's full, All of scripture is full of speech like that. It's a symbol. It's also a sign. Now, this is where I think the Lord's Supper is really, really rich. It's a sign. It's a sign of God's covenant with us. Notice what Jesus says in verse 20. This is the cup poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. In the other passage it says, this cup is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And this is where I think sacrament, in this sense, is a good term. Because like baptism and the Lord's Supper, they both speak of the forgiveness of sins. They are God's covenant sign. And this is really, really important in the Bible. Covenant sign is a pledge from God. All the covenants in the Bible had a sign. The most famous, a really famous one, is the rainbow. When God sent the rainbow, he said to Noah, look at the rainbow, and when I see it, I'll see that I won't flood the world again. See, God gave a word 
and he gave a covenant sign. That's what the Lord's Supper is. When you see a rainbow, you can see God made a promise. When you look at the bread and wine of the supper, you see symbolized, and as a sign and a seal, all of the promises of God in Christ Jesus. All that Christ is and all that Christ has done is signed and sealed in the bread and the wine and the water of baptism. The most famous modern equivalent of this is your wedding ring. What do the bride and groom say to each other? They put the ring on and they say, with this ring I be wed, with my body I be honour, all my goods I give to you forever, something like that. And when husband and wife do that, they say, I'm giving myself to you and only to you. I'm giving all that I have to you. And the pledge and the sign of that promise is the ring. And that's what the water of baptism and the bread and wine of the supper are. When you look at them, you can look at all the promises of God, symbolised, that are in Christ Jesus, that are yes and amen, and say they are mine. The forgiveness of sins, the justification of my person, my adoption into Christ, me dying to my old self, my name is written in heaven forever. Christ is pure and holy and he took my sin and it's gone. And that's God's sign. God's given that sign to me to reassure me and strengthen me in that. Just like you do when you look at your wedding ring. That's your sign. That's to remind you that you gave yourself to your spouse and that they gave themselves to you. The bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper is God's covenant sign to us that he has given himself to us in Christ and that we are giving ourselves to him. It's an oath, a sacrament. God's oath to us and our oath to him. I think that's rich. I think when you really come to grips with that, the Lord's Supper is so humbling and so exciting. It's the gospel signed and sealed to us. It's our pledge from God to us. A visible word proclaimed and declared. Spirit. Spirit. I believe I've just talked about how the Lord's Supper is God's visible word and how the word of God strengthens our faith. When the word's preached and we see it symbolised in the supper, our faith should be strengthened. There's a famous passage in John chapter 6 where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And he says there that whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. What does it mean to eat Jesus' flesh and drink his blood? Well, if you eat his flesh and drink his blood and have eternal life, what else does it say in John's Gospel? He who believes in the Son has eternal life. Eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood is a metaphor for faith. When we come to the supper, trusting Jesus as our saviour, we see his promises signed and sealed and symbolised in the supper and our faith is strengthened. And by the Holy Spirit, we have fellowship with Jesus. Thomas Cramner, who was the first Protestant Archbishop of Canterbury, put it like this. In his book on the Lord's Supper, he said, Eat the f that flesh and drink that drink means simply to abide in Christ. It's a metaphor. Again, it's a metaphor for faith and fellowship with Jesus. And 
one Scottish pastor called Robert Bruce, not to be confused with Robert the Bruce, that was the King of Scots who beat the English, Robert Bruce, a Scottish pastor in the 1500s, put it even simply and more beautifully like this. We receive Christ in the supper the way we receive Christ in the word. Content thyself with that. But I don't think you have to content yourself. I think that's beautiful. You see, when you read the New Testament, or the Old Testament for that matter, you see Jesus. You see him pointed forward to in the Old Testament and pointed back to in the New Testament. You read all about his person. How he delights in the fear of God, how he did the will of God, how he was obedient, how he loved, how he was kind, how he died for our sins, how he was pure and holy and set apart, and how his death bore the wrath of God for our sins, and how we have forgiveness, we have new life, we have a new start day after day, all that. We have an eternal hope in heaven. And when you read the word, you see all that and you think, wow, that's amazing. Praise God. Thank you, God. I'm sorry that I don't live like the way I should. And give me grace to rejoice in this. That's why we receive Christ in the word. And all that is symbolized in the supper. And so we receive it. And again, to quote Cramner, he puts it beautifully. If you go to CCP, you'll hear Alan and Adam say this. We feed on Jesus in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. So yes, I suppose I do believe in the real presence, but it's in our hearts. It's not in the bread and the wine, either physically or spiritually. I'm afraid I think Calvin got that a bit wrong. When he talked about spiritually eating the body and blood of Christ, it seems to me like he meant you spiritually eat the physical body of Christ. If it sounds confusing, it is. I think this view that we feed on him in our hearts like we do in the word is much richer and more simple and more beautiful and more scriptural. And that's why I like the word ordinance. There's several ordinances which Christ has given the church to get to know him through. The word, baptism and the Lord's Supper, preaching, worshipping, fellowshipping, meditating, all them are how we have fellowship with Jesus. All of them. But that doesn't mean that baptism and the Lord's Supper are unimportant. As signs, which we looked at a few minutes ago, they are unique. Only baptism and Lord's Supper are the signs of God's covenant for the church. So even though we have loads of ways to feed on Christ, that doesn't mean the baptism and the Lord's Supper are unimportant. They are God's new covenant signs for his people. They're very important. And I'll just... Uh, for, for my friend Eric, I'll quote Ulrich Swingley, who said, To eat the body of Christ spiritually is nothing else than to trust in spirit and heart upon the mercy and goodness of God through Christ. It's faith. It's faith and fellowship with Jesus. And that's how we share Christ at the Lord's Supper. We see the bread and the wine. The Holy Spirit reminds us of all these truths. And we feed on Jesus in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. What effects should that have on us? This is the third point. What effect should we have on us? Should this have on us, excuse me. Well, Brother Phil, I think he leads communion beautifully. Phil Isherwood. Excuse me, a really godly man and a, a pleasure. Just a pleasure, Phil Isherwood. But when he, when he led communion, he always, well, a lot of the time mentioned something. He says, when we come to the supper, we can have tears of repentance and tears of joy. And it's that, you know, sorrow and joy are not exclusive in the Bible. You can do both at the same time. We should come to the Lord's Supper sorrowful and humbled for our sin. When we look at the bread and the wine, 
Remember that it took the death of the Son of God to save us. It took Jesus' death to save us. The spotless, pure, holy Lamb of God. And what he went through for us. That should humble us. But we should also rejoice. Because Christ did all that for us. Because he loved God and he loved his neighbour. And all our sins are gone. They're gone forever. So we can rejoice. We can have joy for what Christ has done and peace of conscience. But we should come repentant. An unrepentant heart has no place at the Lord's Supper. So we should come repenting of our sins. And that may mean saying sorry to somebody. If you've fallen out with someone, you shouldn't come to this table until it's sorted. But you should get it sorted quickly. To quote Bishop Ryle again, to be unfit to go to the Lord's Supper is to be unfit to die. Think well on that. The Lord's Supper is that time. The Lord's Supper should make us love Christ and his church more. It's a church ordinance. It's a church sacrament. It's, a, it's Christ's pledge to his church. So we should see how much he loves us and we should respond in love and we should love those whom he loved. So when we look around us, we see our brothers and sisters, we should come closer to them. And it should have a sanctifying effect. Sanctification, that's the next topic. Week after, well, a couple of weeks from now. Holiness, it should make us want to be more like Jesus. The old hymn by Isaac Watts, Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. When we look at what Jesus went through for us, We should say, I will be more holy. I will be jealous for the glory of his name. I will live a life of thankful obedience to him. Because he loved me and gave himself for me. And so we have the Lord's Supper. That's the effect it should have on us. So next, when we gather... When you come to the supper, prepare, participate, ponder, and practice. Prepare, confess your sins beforehand, get right with God, get right with everybody else. Think, have a little meditate. And meditation in the Bible is where you think about something. Think about the truths of the cross, what Jesus went through, and what it means for you. And then come and take, partake. See Christ symbolised. See that sign. God's, hear God say, you're mine and I'm yours. That's what God says to you. And feed on him in your heart by faith of thanksgiving. And then go from the table thinking about all that Christ is. All that he's done for you. All the blessings he's given you that were signed in that in that ordinance, that beautiful sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And then practice. Let's be more holy, godly, pure, more loving, kind, spirit-filled, fruit-filled Christians. A change from one degree of glory to the other. And let's remember our eternity. The Lord's Supper is pointing to eternity where we will look forever on the lamb who was slain and we'll say worthy is the lamb to receive glory and honor and power and all the other blessings that the book of revelation gives him because by his because he was slain and by his blood he has ransomed a people for God <laughs>
and all heaven will sing his praise forever. And it won't be long enough to sing his praise because of what he's done. So we'll have the reality forever and ever and ever. We proclaim his death till he comes. So that's the Lord's Supper. That's what he gave us. And that's what it points to. So take it seriously. Take it joyfully. And take it thankfully. Amen.